Well, hello again. We're continuing our study of 2 Thessalonians. This is the second uh, lesson in 2 Thessalonians, the 13th lesson in our series that we've been doing since we've been in isolation. And so we're picking up our account with uh, verse 11 of chapter 1. We covered down to verse 10 in our last lesson. And we noted that Paul used his standard formula of expressing thanks for the church he was addressing, followed by his prayer for them. It is also standard for him to use the giving of thanks for them as an occasion to do some doctrinal teaching, and he did that. And so now uh, we'll have a word of prayer. I want to then review just a little bit from that lesson as we then look at the prayer itself in verses 11 and 12. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we just stop to praise you and thank you for your holy word and pray that you would guide our study today and, and give your wisdom and understanding to each of us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. By way of review of last week's lesson, Paul started by noting the Thessalonians' growing faith, their love for each other, and patience and faithfulness in tribulations. He then went on to expound on the righteous judgment of God concerning them and concerning those who were their persecutors. Keep all that in mind as we read his prayer for them in the next two verses. Verse 11 starts with the word wherefore, referring back to all that he has said in verses 3 through 10. So let's read that prayer in verses 11 and 12. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in verse 5, Paul had said that the Thessalonians' church, uh, church's faith, love, and endurance were evidence of their worthiness of the kingdom of God. And then here he prays and says that God, prays that God would count you worthy of his calling. So, What's he saying here that's different than back in verse 5? Remember back in verse 5 it says that God correctly judged ahead of time that going through their sufferings and tribulations would reveal that they were worthy. Now Paul is asking God to consider them worthy of going on to greater spiritual maturity. To fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power means to come to a place of spiritual maturity or completeness. In one sense, every Christian is worthy of that by virtue of his or her salvation. But in another sense, we become worthy of further development tomorrow as we cooperate with the process of sanctification today. The Thessalonians had cooperated with the process so far, and Paul's earnest desire for them was to go on with God to maturity. So what is the process, you ask? Well, the process is that we must put forth the effort to grow, understanding that the power to do so comes completely from God, and that we access His power through faith. Verse 11 is a purpose statement. It states the purpose of God for every believer and for every church. God wants all Christians to go on to maturity. Then verse 12 is the result statement. It states the result that will occur as the purpose is fulfilled. The result that will occur is that Christ will be glorified in the church, and the church will be glorified in Christ. To glorify someone means to bring honor to him or her. The ultimate glorification of both Christ and the church will be when Christ returns and gathers his church to him. At that time, we will become like him. However, before he returns, Christ and the church can be glorified by becoming as much like him as possible. That's what Christian maturity is, being as Christ-like as we possibly can be. We can learn a lot about what we should be praying for each other by looking at Paul's prayers for the churches. He was always praying for spiritual growth for Christians becoming more Christ-like. And I'm sure that Paul prayed for individuals, and when he did, that he prayed for growth in the areas of their spiritual shortcomings. Much more important than physical health is spiritual health. And if we believe that to be a true statement, where should the emphasis of our prayers for each other be? Hmm. Maybe we spend too much time on the physical side, and I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for people's physical health, because that's certainly biblical. But we need to spend more time praying for each other's spiritual growth and well-being. 
All right, so that concludes chapter one. Now I want to move into chapter two, and I'm going to read the first 15 verses because it's all one section uh, dealing with a, with a false doctrine. But we're only going to get down through verse nine in our study today, but I'll read the whole thing. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. For even, excuse me, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, will all power and signs and lying, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God, always to God, for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, wherein too he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So, here Paul deals with a false doctrine that had been taught in the Thessalonian church. The first two verses are the introduction of the topic. In verse 1, the topic is stated as the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. In verse 2, Paul introduces two assertions about the topic that he intends to make in the following verses. The first assertion is that the day of the Lord is not at hand, and the second is that the church should not succumb so easily to false teaching. Although Paul spends more words on the proof of the first assertion, the introduction puts the emphasis on the second as the most important. The disturbing thing to Paul was how easily they were misled. He starts by beseeching them. He pleads with them to get this right. The rest of verse 1 is a topic about which they were misled. What he beseeches is that they would, not, is that they would be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. The word translated shaken literally means shaken as in a storm or an earthquake. Of course, here we're talking spiritually, not physically. And the word troubled means alarmed or frightened. Paul is saying, please don't let false doctrines shake you up or frighten you. There is no reason for that to happen. You can avoid being shaken and troubled by false doctrine by understanding how to tell false doctrine from true. At the time of the writing of this letter, the New Testament wasn't in the excuse me, was in the process of being written, but it wasn't complete. Their source of truth was what they had been taught by Paul when he was present with them. We have the advantage of the completed Bible. So they were to compare what they were hearing with what Paul had said before. We are to compare any claims of spiritual truth to what's in God's Word. Getting back to the text, Paul gives three sources of false doctrine. The first is by spirit, meaning by someone claiming spiritual insight or prophesying. The second is by word, meaning someone giving a logical argument. And the third is by a letter falsely claiming to be from Paul. Whether or not all three were in play in the false teaching dealt with here, we don't know. However, based on other things said in this book, we can be pretty sure that the last one, the false letter, was part of the problem. There were three ways that the Thessalonian church should have known whether a letter supposedly from Paul was authentic or not. 
The first was by the courier. Paul always sent his letters by someone known and trusted by both him and the church he was sending the letter to. His courier to the Thessalonians was Timothy, who had been present with Paul's missionary team when they preached at Thessalonica. They knew and could trust Timothy. The second one was by the salutation written in his own hand. Take a look at the chapter 3, verse 17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Paul always closed the letter by writing the salutation in his own hand. The third was by the content. If it didn't agree with what Paul had taught them when he was there in person, it was a false letter. Now let's deal with the last part of verse 2. The Thessalonians believed that the day of Christ was at hand. So what was their real misunderstanding? The phrase is at hand could be taken to mean either the day is here as in already happened or the day is imminent. Two arguments support the first interpretation. The Greek verb is in the perfect tense, meaning already completed. And secondly, believing that the day of Christ is imminent is biblical. Paul taught it, and we still teach it. So, the misunderstanding was that they thought it had already happened. If they thought that the day of Christ had already come, then there must have been some misunderstanding on their part as to what constitutes the day of Christ. We see from what Paul said in chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, and in the next few verses, that Paul focuses on the phrase, Day of Christ, as specifically meaning the Second Coming. The Thessalonians obviously knew that the Second Coming hadn't occurred, Christ hadn't reappeared. So they must have been including the tribulation that is to precede the Second Coming as being part of the Day of Christ. Someone was teaching them that their current tribulations were part of the Great Tribulation. In verses 3 through 10, Paul presents his arguments as to how they should have known the day of Christ had not already occurred. He starts verse 3 by saying, Don't let anyone deceive you by any means, and then goes on to present three things which must occur before the day of Christ. The first two are given in verse 3. They are a falling away, meaning a turning away from the worship of the true God, and the revelation of the son of perdition. We commonly refer to him as the Antichrist. In verses 6 through 8, the third argument is given. The Antichrist can't be revealed until someone or something who is restraining him is removed. The word let here in verse 7 does not mean allow. It is just the opposite. It means to hinder. Now, let's get back and discuss these verses in a little more detail. As we said, the first item which must occur is a falling away. The Greek word here has come right over into English. It's apostasy. If you look up apostasy in the dictionary, it means abandonment of what one has voluntarily professed, total desertion of principles of faith. We understand that the church isn't going to be here anymore at that time, so who is going to fall away? There is a thing which, for lack of a better term, I call Christendom. It includes both the true believers and those who profess the philosophies of Christianity but have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When real Christians, excuse me, when the real Christians are removed, what's left of Christendom, which is probably the majority of it, will turn away from the worship of God. They'll sell out to the Antichrist. The second thing will be the revelation of the Antichrist himself. He is called that man of sin and the son of perdition. There are a lot of things you might imply from the term man of sin, but I think the implication here is that he will be an intentional breaker of God's moral law. The term son of perdition is the same term applied to Judas Iscariot back in John 17, 12. It identifies him as one destined to total destruction. This is an assurance to Christians that he, that is the Antichrist, will lose. In verse 4 we see that he sets himself up as God. This is a description not only of his action, but of his character. He is a person of extreme arrogance. He opposes the worship of anyone or anything other than himself. He is going to attempt to bring the whole world together into one religion with him as its God. Verses 5 through 7 are parenthetical as Paul reminds 
the Thessalonians of what he had already taught them. In verse 5, Paul reminds them of the fact that this false teaching is opposite from what he taught them in person. Comparing what they had been taught with the claims of the false letter proved it was false. For us, the comparison must be with the Bible. If a doctrine doesn't agree with the Bible, it is false. He then goes on in verses 6 through 7, reminding them of the fact that there is one who now restrains all this from happening. We understand this to mean the Holy Spirit, who will be removed when the church is removed. At that time, Satan and his Antichrist will have free reign. Note, however, in verse 7, that the mystery of iniquity is already at work. In 1 John, this is referred to as the spirit of Antichrist. In other words, Satan, even back then in the first century, was already laying the groundwork for his final attempt to overthrow God. In verse 8, we get back to the main teaching of the passage and are told that only after the removal of the Holy Spirit shall the Antichrist be revealed. And he is given another name here, Wicked. The word translated wicked means destitute of law. He will in no way submit to God's moral law. But we are again assured in the latter half of the verse that he will be defeated. In verse 9, we see that Satan will give the Antichrist the power to counterfeit all the miracles of Christ. The terms powers, signs, and wonders are all used to describe Christ's miracles in the gospel. Power means strength and ability, and is obviously referring to the ability to do miracles. Signs are deeds that indicate a greater truth than the sign itself, and wonders are acts that inspire awe. And of course, he's, the word lying there it means it's counterfeit. The Antichrist will mislead people by performing great counterfeit miracles. We're going to stop here for today. It's to be continued next week, but before we quit... Let's think for a minute about application from what we looked at today. First, there is the point about growing in Christian maturity by putting out the effort while at the same time depending on the power of God to daily work out sanctification in us. Second, there is the need to understand that Satan has great power to mislead even now before the church and the Holy Spirit are removed from the earth. And third, there is the admonition to not get misled by false doctrine. Always compare spiritual instruction to the Bible. It is the one true source that we can rely upon. We'll pick up with verse 10 next week.